Hi, I'm Rich Sains, and you're listening to the Procurement Conversations Big Conversation. Join me as I talk to procurement leaders and industry specialists about the biggest issues facing our profession. This episode is part one of our look at procurement's gender problem. I'm joined by Laura Scarf and Sharon Morris. Hi Rich, thanks for having me. Um, Yes, I'm Laura Scarf. I'm the founder and owner of Business Academy Online, which is a procurement and emotional intelligence training. And I've also founded the FLIP movement of female leaders in procurement. And so my background is that I've taught buyers SIPs training and other emotional intelligence training for about 15 years now. Hi, and Sharon. Yeah, hi, I'm I'm Sharon Morris, and I'm in Melbourne, Australia, and um, I actually uh, found procurement. I'd been in a not-for-profit career managing uh, CEO of a foundation that raised funds for breast cancer research, and when I was thinking about where to next in terms of my purpose-led leadership, um, I thought uh, I had procurement and supply put under my nose. So I thought procurement, what do I know about procurement? It's quite surprising when you're a CEO of a small not-for-profit, you know a heck of a lot about procurement. Um, But I ended up being the general manager of the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply uh, in the ANZ region. Um, Loved working across the sector uh, with members. And um, what I found uh, throughout my journey at SIPS was that there are fantastic women in the profession, uh, procurement and supply, Uh, but there are still some major disadvantages for women in the profession. And so uh, eventually I went and worked uh, for Procurious, um, heading up a leadership program for women in procurement and supply. And uh, now I'm in consulting and um, looking at opportunities to help with diversity and inclusion. Great to have you here. And it's a a very important conversation to have. Uh, So let's look at what the data says about the, the current state of gender diversity in procurement. So at a senior level, we've got 25% of the roles. This is in the UK, but led by uh, females. Uh, in the UK, there's also a 25% salary difference, so and which is quite consistent across public and private sector. On average, that's about 96k for male and 77k for female. That's in pounds. 45% of women, according to the Procurious Report, uh, feel their workplace as a whole embraces gender equality. And the Gartner Supply Chain Report, there's about 41% of female representation in supply chain jobs i think sharon as you were saying it's you know it's 50 50 in terms of the grassroots membership at sips why do you feel the gender balance in procurement has been slow to change especially at that high level yeah i I think diversity um in the profession is is good i think if you look at the reflection of um, the membership base particularly at sips um it's 50 50 it's where you get into the higher levels of management in um, procurement and supply that we're starting to see uh, a decrease of women. And particularly, you hardly get anyone in the C-suites or in board, board positions. So I think that's where the major concern is. And there are lots of things that we can do as a profession to try and, and tackle that. But I think, yeah, the diversity is good and there's a huge amount of opportunities to then help shift it so that it's going up the line in terms of those senior positions and we're getting... Um, equity at those those levels as well. And just to add to that, I think from some of the very small amount of research that has been done in this area, um, there were a couple of things that were highlighted in certain reports. Um, one in particular talks about cultural factors that, you know, if men are in those positions, we do tend to hire people who are like us. And so then that creates that kind of um, self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will. And also pre-pandemic, there was a, a study called Access Denied, looking at female representative uh, representation in procurement. And they looked at travel as being a huge factor that may stop women um, from necessarily being able to rise in their careers when they have you know, child rearing responsibilities and so on. So that can be a huge issue. And also, I think the fact that we stayed for a while in a very much of a traditional procurement bubble of not necessarily being seen as strategic. And so there wasn't the maturity that you necessarily start to see now in organizations. And there seems to be a lack, um, an, a correlation between lack of procurement maturity and lack of representation of women in those higher roles. So I think the more that procurement has been seen as this strategic function, um, the more kind of, as you say, as Sharon says, the diversity is there. It is about making sure that people can go through that glass ceiling or marzipan layer or whatever you like to call it. Um, and that's what we need. Uh, yeah, I think we said, we mentioned this maybe before where 
actually if it's a more tactical function it is a little bit banging the table it's a siloed mentality it's lots of escalations lots of sort of arguments and stuff and and yeah maybe to an extent suited more to male or, or perpetuated by it you know <laughs> sort of keeping the the function in that in that um in that state rather than moving into more of a strategic function i mean what would you say the, the specific st- skills or qualities that that women bring to the profession I'd say, you know, when you look at the skills of the procurement professionals and the ones that are kind of in the in the top five, if you like, it's it's communication, it's influencing, it's negotiation, it's that internal and external um, relationship management. And um, I would say that some of those qualities are very much um, feminine qualities. Uh, in particular, what I see is that the ability to listen and really understand and then provide solutions to our conversation is really interesting. Over the last couple of years, I've noticed a significant shift of women in sustainability. And I was just chairing a conference a couple of months ago and 60% of the speakers were female and more than 60% of the audience were female. And I think that's a really interesting sort of slant in terms of we're looking to procurement and supply to solve, you know, the issues of sustainability, the 90% of issues that are happening throughout the supply chain. So it's really interesting to see women are really attracted to that sustainability side, that nurturing, caring element, and that that's now going to come through in the procurement and supply. But I would say the communications and those influencing and negotiation skills and that listening case are really spot on and, and more you know, on a side of a, a feminine um, a trait, if you like. But that is a massive generalisation, um, but it's something that women can bring to the table. I completely agree with Sharon. I think it, it comes down to that communication and actually developing rapport and connections. And that is something that studies have shown that women are very good at. In fact, one of the things that I was quite interested in in my research in this area was that female leaders as a whole, not just in procurement, are actually brilliant at transformational change. And obviously we've gone through huge amounts of transformational change from the pandemic to Brexit to what is happening at the world at this moment. And I think because women do tend to take more of a democratic approach and build those connections on average, these are stereotypes, yes, but uh, the science does back some of this up. Um, this can make us really effective in that transformational change, that revolution um, steps, because we're able to build those connections with the people that we need and to read and be empathetic to the people who are struggling with these changes, because this is a huge change for people to have to deal with. Yeah, I was just going to say, and, and the change, particularly what's happening with regards to sustainability, um, there, you know, there is a huge adaptability there, and you're right. Emotional, compassionate, all of those elements. Um, so, all I can see is opportunity for women in this profession, and we should be really shouting from the rooftops, coming to this profession because these are amazing skills that you get to use, and and um, and and they're well worth it in terms of you know you know delivering on what you can what your own skills are but you know the skills that are needed by the profession well, that's the danger i guess is that coming into the profession and seeing that it's largely in some areas is male dominated and then you sort of go out and go back into other areas of the business that, that may be less so but i totally agree with the transformation of change you have to bring people on the journey and change isn't something that people really like to be just done to them they they like to feel that they're, they're sort of engaged uh, and then yeah the, the soft skills piece definitely some of them i've worked with some fantastic uh, female procurement leaders and their skills around communication, influencing, negotiation were like second to none. Some of the definitely some of the best procurement people I've ever worked with have been been female. What are the main issues you'd say that women face in the workplace? I think this is a really complex question because there are so many layers of issues. And I'm sure myself and Sharon could probably talk about this for a day, let alone within a few minutes. And um, but from my perspective. I think there is a situation where women are essentially held to a higher standard than men within the roles across different professions, not just procurement. There is the Goldilocks syndrome that women are too warm. They're too strong. They're just not quite right. And the fact is, no matter what they do and how they adapt themselves, it's never quite enough to meet what that narrow perception or stereotype, shall we say, of leadership or what a good procurement professional is. And I think sometimes that can be quite demoralizing for women and it feels like an uphill struggle. And so what you might find is that 
you know, one, once you get to a certain level, perhaps they're having children or perhaps they're just burnt out of having to constantly prove themselves over and over again, then you get certain women opting out. So I think that can be something that's really difficult for women to be able to deal with. And, and you know, I would add to that and say the number one thing, the main issue for women are facing is the gender pay gap. I mean, let's seriously look at that. Let's get organisations to actually measure what they're doing in their, in, with regards to gender pay gap. Let's get them to reveal it in, in terms of gender pay gap, which is what's happening in Australia. They'll have to report in 2024 um, on their gender pay gap. And that will start getting people moving in terms of getting women paid the correct rates. They should be paid up against their male counterparts. I think that's massive. And I also think one of the main issues that women aren't getting the opportunity um, for leadership training, but also leadership and um, mentoring support within their organisation. And I think that shows, you know, not only the pay gap, but also the lack of representation of women in the C-suite on board positions you know, you need to be supported. You need to have the right pay. You need to have the right networks, you know. And, and I also think the other kind of elephant in the room in terms of issues is the one that we're looking at sort of sort of more globally across um, professions is sexual harassment. I mean, you know, the gender-based violence that happens at home and happens in the workplace is absolutely frightening. And it's something that workplaces really, really need to address, their sexual harassment, particularly um, in our region, APAC region, across Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, places like that. You know, sexual harassment is a real issue. So it's something we still need to look at. You wouldn't think so in 2023 but it is something you need to look at you've also got the unconscious bias as well that and the the gender stereotypes that are still pervasive to this day and a lot of times even with women we may have that internalized misogyny occasionally um and so i think training in that area is something that is incredibly key because that will then hopefully help with what sharon was talking about as well because once you deal with the root of this kind of kernel of sometimes hatred towards women or or holding women to these different standards then it may hopefully start to flood down and people are able to recognize that we all have these and how we can kind of address it in the workplace and personally as well yeah i mean there there is a societal element to it as well isn't there which uh, is a lot harder to change but uh, and i know you, you know I, I will have certain biases and sometimes you you spot them and sometimes you don't but uh, I, I live in a household with uh, I've got two daughters and uh, my wife so they're, they're doing a great job at educating me on the on the right way around things yeah I guess more deeply how how can organizations create a more inclusive and supportive environment to, for women to excel in procurement and more importantly I guess reach those leadership roles I guess I'm going to say the same things really that there needs to be training in unconscious biases there needs to be better female leadership training as a whole um, there needs to be more of an awareness and policies and processes, like Sharon said, in terms of um, sexual harassment and making sure that there is a very clear, um, I always think that people like to go into a grey area, so a very clear distinction of what that amounts to and a, a process for managing that. And I think also for me, I think it is there is this paradigm of leadership of that this is a powerful banging on the tables, you know, someone who's going to stand up and not show emotion and, and, and really show that they can hold the world on their shoulders. That needs to change. That whole idea of, of what a leader is needs to be worked on. And a new paradigm of leadership should be created, one which includes things like compassion, which includes empathy, which includes collaboration, because I think now the prevailing thought in procurement is that we need collaboration with our supply chain especially during what we've gone through with pandemics and 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 so on it's shown the importance and the key uh, requirement of our supply chains and keeping them resilient to keep them resilient we need that kind of collaboration we need that empathy we need that connection with our supply chain and with our teams and that is something that is going to be really difficult to do because it's ingrained and so over time, it's going to be basically organizations and, and, and institutions working on what actually is leadership for us.
when I think and I see the stats that it's going to take 130 years for gender equality, then I immediately think we have to sit down and create targets for our workforces. So when you're thinking about recruitment, you want to think about or, you know, or promoting women, you want to actually put in a target. Okay, we want 30% of women in senior positions and we want to build on that. So I think that's really important for organisations to do. And I think it does come with, we talk a lot about flexible work uh, arrangements, um, but there needs to be more flexibility in the workplace for everyone. And there's a lot of talk at the moment about going back into the office and the reasons why we need to go back into the office because it's costing organisations a huge amount of money to have offices. But we really need to focus on why we have flexibility and why we offer flexibility for our, for our teams and our staff. And um, I think it does come back to what Laura, Laura said is, is around that education piece. But I would argue we need to go further. And there's a bit of a growing movement about why is it always the female's issue? The female's got to do the course. The female's got to worry about imposter syndrome. The female's got to worry about gender bias. I would invite the male leaders, the male staff, I would invite them to come to women in leadership training and actually see the perspective of a woman. You know, learn what it is to sit around a table and to not be heard. And then for someone else to say your idea and come up with that idea. Learn what it's like to come to work, um, you know, going through a transition of life like menopause. You know, all those sorts of things to be able to understand and listen from a woman's perspective. And I think that would make amazing managers if if men did that. So, you know, kind of come from a perspective of a woman to understand where they're coming from and what their struggles are and not always it be the woman's problem to fix. I really love that point. That is something that I've been arguing because when you read some of the literature in terms of female leadership, it's all about leaning in, being more confident, work on your imposter syndrome. But then that links to that Goldilocks syndrome that no matter what you do, you might be too warm or you might be too strong. So you're still not able to break through the barriers. So this is why it's really important to have male voices as part of this. And I totally agree with Sharon. I think that there needs to be this kind of mix of leadership training so you can see from a female's perspective. I don't know how that would look and how it would go down with organizations right now. But I think once you set those policies and you set those targets that Sharon's talking about, then it creates a level of momentum for organizations to get involved in things like this. So I 100% I agree. The next question was, was how can men help? I've read the authority gap and that's really eye-opening as a, as a book as to the differences and the, the, that, that unconscious bias. And it does, it does bring it to light. And, and I think it's one of those things that most men are, are sort of decent people. And I guess as soon as you, you've been made aware of it, then actually you have a better understanding of it. And some of it is just literally you have no understanding of until, until you're made aware of it. So it is, um, it's important to be, be a bit more empathetic. So if, you know, if I think about how men can help, yes, you know, from a female perspective, address our unconscious bias, but also call it out. Give women credit for their ideas. Um, you know, if you're in the position of authority, hold the room and make sure that you're listening to all the voices. Sam, have you told us all about this? Lisa, what are your thoughts on this? You know, really opening people up. And that happens across all sorts of diversity. It doesn't matter if you're female or you come from a different cultural background. You know, we have to change our leadership styles so that we're hearing all the voices in the room. And it may be that you're having a conversation outside of the room with that person to really understand where they're coming from. Um, and I do think sponsors and mentors, whether they be male or female, but how powerful is it to, for you to actually tap someone on the shoulder and say, hey, Lisa, I think you should speak at this conference. Lisa's never spoken before, but just having someone give you that acknowledgement that I think you can do this and I'm going to support you to do that, I think is, is so powerful um, and change the landscape as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Champion of a woman really if you see bias happening call it out a lot of the times there can be inertia um and people don't want to rock the boat if you will um but you're in a position of power potentially and so you can help other women do that um we we kind of talk about in women's kind of training that we should back up our voices so if we get interrupted that the woman should then interrupt back and help them but that 
needs male allies to do it as well. So it's not just on the females to be able to do this. And also, I think you're absolutely right. When I started talking about female leadership training for procurement, I got a lot of men saying, well, what about male leadership procurement training? And there is this sort of defensiveness that can come up. And this is not a we hate men club. You know, this is not what we're saying here at all. All we want is to make sure that we get to the gender pay equality and we get treated in the same way. And I think a lot of this is unconscious, that is unknown, and it can happen from both male and females. So really, it's just creating that conversation. And I think having the openness to have the conversation, whether it's in the room or outside the room, as Sharon says, is just such a huge thing. Because half the time, I've spoken to women about this, I've done focus groups on this area, they felt almost that they couldn't raise an issue because they didn't want to get a defensive reaction and and then something may happen in their career from that. And people should be able to raise their voice about these issues and they should be able to um, have the self-awareness. People should have the self-awareness to think that this is not a personal attack. This is, okay, this is interesting. What can we do to learn from this? So it's having that level of emotional intelligence, I guess. And the next time a man says to you, what about the, the male training and procurement leadership? You can say, I've got one. And it explains to you everything about the, the female perspective. Yeah, exactly. And I love the idea about, um, uh, you know, mentoring. You know, there's so many great male leaders out there. How about you get yourself a female mentor? A, maybe you know, a millennial or, you know, think, think about that perspective in terms of, um, you know, actually doing a structured mentoring program, but kind of in a reverse way. I spoke to um, someone recently who was doing the Women in Leadership um, program, male, and he said the perspective that he he wanted to get was he has a female manager and he ha- he leads a female team. So why wouldn't he want to get the perspective of a woman so he can be a better employee, a better teammate and a, and a better manager? So I thought that was a really mature approach to it. Definitely. What initiatives or projects are you currently working on or involved in that aim to advance the cause of women in procurement leadership? Well, last year I created the kind of movement, as I like to call it, called FLIP, which is the female leaders in procurement movement. And it was based off 18 months worth of research into this area. And there's very little research into female leadership in procurement in general. And from this movement, we created three major aims. One, that there needed to be better female leadership training, which does involve men as well. Two, that there needs to be cross-industry networking for women in procurement. Um, There's some amazing things that are happening in different industries, uh, but they are within that industry and we're not getting that um, cross-functional or network approach. And thirdly, uh, female uh, representation is key. So representation, mentorship, championship, People need to believe, women need to believe that they can achieve these things. And to see that representation is really powerful. So from that, we created our first FLIP uh, summit that we had this year. It went fantastically. And we're going to be doing many more over the next couple of years. And our female leadership six-month training begins in January 2024. So that's currently what I'm working on. I'm also part of the Procurious Bravo leadership training of which I'm doing some particular female negotiation training about having a seat at the table and and using our strengths to be the best negotiators. And I've just been involved um, setting up the program for 2024 for the Bravo Leadership Program. And now I'm really focused uh, in kind of a different perspective. um, And in particular, I'm I'm having a look under the lid of the organisation called the Gender Fair Index, and that's an organisation based out of the United States that's going into um, major corporate um, workplaces and doing basically that, seeing how fair they are with regards to gender. And it's really interesting in a moment in time for me here in Australia because the workplace gender equality in Australia is mandating um, through legislation that if you've got more than 100 employees in Australia, that you will have to report on the gender pay gap. So it comes back to that idea that we really need to be able to measure performance and we really need to put up a spotlight to say, oh, is Hewlett-Packard doing that? Are they doing that? Are they gender fair? Oh, then I want to buy their products. Or if Microsoft is doing that, then I want to buy their products because they're gender fair. So it's coming back to that mass market in terms of, 
once um, we're starting to show what different, you know, shame and show um, what people are doing, then organisations are doing, then we can choose as customers as to who we purchase from. What Gender Fair have noticed is that one of the major gaps when they're doing this analysis on the index is the way of gender responsive procurement. So working with female businesses is a great way to really drive gender equality. So that's part of their index is making sure that companies are not only doing internal work around gender equality, but they're also making sure their suppliers are addressing um, purchasing from women-owned businesses or addressing gender equality. That will really help shift the dial. So I'm really excited to see what these organisations are going to be doing over the next 12 to, to 18 months. Brilliant. And what mentorship or networking opportunities have you found to be particularly beneficial for women looking to advance their careers in procurement? I think this is a, a difficult question to answer, unfortunately, because there does seem to be, in the UK at least, I can't speak for the whole world, but in the UK, there, there, there does seem to be a lack of this. Like I said, there are some great things that the NHS are doing. There's things that uh, women in rail are doing. In terms of the industries, yes, there are some amazing networking opportunities. But um, I have about I've taught about three thousand, maybe three and a half thousand female procurement um, buyers, and they're not necessarily in these industries. And so there, there is a lack, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to create the Flip um, Summit. And what I found from that. I was worried that I was going to be speaking to an empty room, but actually we sold out really quickly and um, and I really needed a bigger room. And what everyone was saying here was that it was so nice to be able to talk about issues without worrying about politics within their organization or anything else and have this kind of supportive atmosphere. And they didn't realize how much they needed that until they, they did it. So I think for me, that's what I'm looking for. I've seen that a number of events that have sprung up since then. And I, I'm hoping that this is the start in the UK of um, much more opportunities, because I, I do think getting in the room, especially when we've been stuck in our houses for so long during the pandemic, is incredibly powerful. And to see that the same issues are happening across different industries, you know, it's it makes people feel less alone. And so I do think that there's much more need for this. I, I couldn't agree more. And when, when we've surveyed women, um, you know, the three top areas are pay gap, address the pay gap, leadership training and mentoring and networking. Everybody across um, businesses are looking for mentoring and networking. And no, the profession is not doing it well. So, Laura, you're 100% right. It's the same in the APAC region. Um, more could be done. But I also put it onto the individual. There are plenty of networking opportunities out there within the profession. Um, but what's stopping you from getting people together, building on those networking groups and saying, hey, let's, you know, go out to dinner and have those networking opportunities. But I think there is a massive gap and it is absolutely needed because women have said they've needed it. Um, so we need to work harder on creating those opportunities for women across the profession, definitely. Brilliant. And what would you say the future looks like for procurement, especially in relation to more diverse teams? I would say the future is really exciting. And it's exciting because of all those skills that we have talked about that women bring to the profession. It's exciting because of what I'm seeing antidotally, I haven't got the stats to prove this, is I'm seeing a number of fabulous women enter this profession and they're hugely ambitious and they really are shifting the dial in terms of the work they're delivering and the impact they're making. And Laura, you mentioned at the top of the hour about um, strategy and having a real strategic um, focus on procurement. I am seeing this being played out um, with some amazing women working in the profession. So I think that procurement and supply, our profession, could really be the pin-up poster um, profession for all other professions of how to behave in the diversity space and not only get your house in order in terms of internally, um, internally addressing um, diversity and inclusion, but also let's see how we can support um, minority businesses, veteran-owned businesses, Indigenous businesses, women-owned businesses to really shift the dial in terms of diversity as a whole because that supply chain is key to making impact across the world, which we know of. So that's what's exciting me both. That's what gives me goosebumps. And that's the challenge I think that procurement and supply can make. 
And I very much agree with Sharon, no surprise there. But I think if I go back to what I was saying about we need to kind of change that paradigm of what leadership is for procurement in particular, um, I think that we're in this really unique time now with the rise in AI, the, you know, the real push for ESG and the environmental social governance and so on. I think that these are the transformational changes that, I mean, AI is the transformational change of all transformational change really, isn't it? And this will push women further forward because essentially if we're great at dealing with this huge change, uh, we it's going to basically um, accelerate that change towards actually what do we need for a procurement leader right now? Well, we need that collaboration. We need that ability to create connections because soft skills, I do hate the term soft skills, professional skills are what is going to be needed when we have all of the automation done through AI and machine learning and whatever it needs to be. We can't remove that human part. And that is where women thrive essentially creating those connections and I also think it's going to be really interesting in terms of the younger generation coming into the workforce and so on so I talk a lot about employee value propositions and how that this is future proofing your organization so for procurement the you know diversity EDI um, is just something that the younger generation are very passionate about they're very passionate about their causes and it gives me hope for the future because I can see that being another factor to push this more and more and I do see it having targets like Sharon said that's what we need so I think that the future is really bright for women in procurement and I, I do think we can lead the way in terms of professions so it gets me really excited that people are actually having the belief that they can be in these roles and that they there can be this gender equity within the procurement world the generation coming into the workforce they don't really take things on face value they they challenge which is which is great because you know if there's any sort of status quo they're not comfortable with it so yeah that's brilliant i i like to call the soft skills i, I call them super skills because i think they're they are the sort of thing that will drive the profession forward and as we said you know as the silos break down you need more collaboration across your organization and i think uh, female leaders in procurement are well placed to to benefit from that so yeah i, I see a bright future for procurement as well in this space the next one was so good books or resources for those who want to find out more, can you suggest any? I think there is a lack of procurement mm. focused female um, resources. I I have, um, there is an interesting study called Access Denied, which is um, by Jennifer Lawrence um, and uh, Nicola Messer. And so I would maybe have a look at that online. I think that's useful to read. That was pre-pandemic, but it's still interesting. In terms of um different kind of reports out there. I think Procurious do a great job. I would read some of the SIPs um, areas. Um, I do think we mentioned this before, but The Authority Gap is an excellent book to, to look at. I actually really enjoyed The Likeability Trap by Alicia Men Menendez, uh, which talks about how women can get stuck in people pleasing and um, and so on. And I thought that was really useful. Um, but there is, there's so much out there that's based on general leadership. I do think, you know, like leaning in, uh, Cheryl Sandberg is a great book, but again, that puts the onus on the woman to change who they are. So I think it's just having an awareness of of different um, different resources out there, but also challenging them. Like you said, the younger generation don't take things at face value. So take the bits that resonate and then challenge the bits that maybe feel a bit uncomfortable for you. I love I love that, and you know I'll just back back that up with that. I think women know where to find the resources out there and. And to some extent, we're sick of reading. Um, but, you know, I think for me, you know, I want to see organisations really start to measure the gender equity gap and analysing that data and reporting on it so that we can read it and have some meaningful data to be able to talk about and discuss and go to the table, go to our bosses, talk about pay gap, all those sorts of things. So I think there needs to be a bit of pressure. Uh, you know, as you said, Laura, there's not a lot of data out there. We need some content so that we can really have informed, make informed decisions and, and you know, challenge the status quo. So I'm going to say I'm sick of reading. <laughs> <laughs> and let's start so, doing. <laughs> so, yeah, and I'll say for the men, definitely read The Authority Gap by Marianne Seacart. Uh, it's a fantastic book. That was um, uh, Lauren Richards uh, who recommended that to me. Uh, Bravo uh, said that it's the Bravo 2023 Women in Procurement and Supply Chain Against the Odds. 
that's the Procurus report that we've referenced in this podcast and also the SIPS Hayes Procurement Salary Guide 2023 was the other uh, source of a lot of the data that we've been talking about. Where can people find you or contact you? Um, so I'm on LinkedIn, um, Laura Scarf. Um, I'm also got a page for Business Academy online, which is my training company and um, Flip Female Leaders in Procurement. So you can find us at the website as well, which is www.businessacademy-online.com and www.femaleleadersinprocurement.com. And you can also find me on LinkedIn and I'm available to empower, support and really champion for women across the globe. Brilliant. Well, great to have you on and uh, so the next year things have improved even more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Do like and share and subscribe to hear the next Procurement Conversation.